Welcome to the Vin Armani Show. We are streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Vin Armani. Also on Twitter and Periscope at Vin Armani is my handle there. And we are streaming live on the Facebook page of our content partner, Activist Post. That's facebook.com slash Activist Post. Interesting story. Although we are streaming live on all of the places that we normally do, an account that is the, the Activist Post YouTube account that has been hosting our clips, the clips of the show, hundreds of clips that we break up every week uh, that we also use to disperse as the embeds that are on various blogs, including my own at vinarmani.com, uh, has now been completely and without notice terminated by YouTube. We're going to talk about that, but uh, we're still broadcasting on YouTube at uh, Vin Armani, just activist post, completely memory hold. We're going to talk about that chilling story, but nothing that we didn't expect. So if you were wondering what happened, you're about to find out. We've got a great show for you today. Besides that, our guest today is Scott Horton, host of the Scott Horton Show uh, podcast, as well as the host of Anti-War Radio with antiwar.com and the author of a new book called Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. We're going to talk about the idea of empire, empire in general, the American empire. They call Afghanistan where empires go to die. And this administration is now ramping up uh, to add more troops to Afghanistan while trying to expand the empire in other places. We're going to talk with him about that, an absolute expert on the subject, so I'm very excited about that. We've got some other stories today. We're going to talk about Bernie Sanders. <laughs> we're going to laugh at Bernie a little bit, but we're, it's not completely funny. We've got a big story today that's a lot about the battle between collectivism and individualism, and we're going to make those distinctions I think you're really going to enjoy today. All of this ties in. It's all part of one thing. And it's the reason why crypto savagery is becoming all the more important. So to help me get through all of this today, my good friend, co-host and producer, Mr. Christian Reyes. Christian. Good morning, Ben. Good morning. Good morning. So <laughs> you may as well jump <laughs> right into activist posts. YouTube.com slash activist posts. Yeah, dude. That has been completely terminated. That's crazy. It happened on, what was it, Friday? Was yeah. it Thursday or Friday? Mm -hmm. Friday. Friday we woke up, looked at the Activist Post channel, completely gone. gone. Fuck. Completely gone. This was, the, this was the message that we got, if you want to throw that up. This account has been terminated due to multiple or severe violations of YouTube's policy against spam, deceptive practices, and misleading content or other terms of service violations. So, of course, we figured this must be a mistake because the only thing that's on that channel is, I mean, besides, there's maybe like a dozen videos from mm -hmm. Derek Bros, from, yeah. right? Where he's just kind of giving updates on Houston Freethinker stuff, on his, his tour and whatnot. Totally innocuous. And then there's clips from our show. Right. And looking at the YouTube community guidelines, First off, there's no spam, certainly no hate speech. Mm -hmm. Like I would dare anyone to go through <laughs> the shows Seriously. and find a single thing that was homophobic, mm -hmm. transphobic, Islamophobic, racist, sexist, against people with disabilities, anything. Anything. In fact, it's the complete opposite of that. Well, the other thing that they have is uh, inciting violence. Right, which is of course the exact opposite of everything. Yeah. The whole, it's the exact opposite of the entire point of this show. Mm -hmm. The entire point of this show is all about nonviolent solutions where currently violence is happening. The only people we ever talk bad about are people being violent. Right. <laughs> That's it. And so this has been it's been mind boggling to me. So of course, activist post reached out to them and said. This has got to be, I'm sure this is a mistake. It's got to be a mistake. Mm -hmm. Here's what they got back. This is that suspense, suspension there. It says, this is from YouTube accounts. Hello, thank you for your account suspension appeal. We have decided to keep your account suspended based on our community guidelines and terms of service. Please visit and the URL for community guidelines that we just talked about for more information. Please do not respond to this email. Replies to this email will not be processed. Please refer to our help center for more information. Sincerely, the YouTube team. So Christian, no reason. 
And not even, there were no strikes on the account. Mm -hmm. It's not copyright violations because all of our stuff is up as Creative Commons, right? Mm -hmm. So anybody can share it. And even, even so, even if they did have a copyright violation, that's not what they, they say, oh, there's a copyright violation. We're either going to demonetize Strike. it, pull it down. Mm -hmm. But even in that case, they could appeal it because I would say, oh, no, they have complete permission, but it's also Creative Commons, so they have the right to do that already. So I'm like, what the, like, what, yeah, what the fuck going on is here? this, uh -huh. right? Like, what's, what's the reason? So I figured it's got to be, it's got to be the last video that went up. Okay, mm -hmm. so let me, let me pref preface it with this. Okay. When I first, so I started researching, like, how does this whole thing work, mm -hmm. right? I wanted to understand. Come to find out, they used to, YouTube, so YouTube definitely has, like, this community guidelines mm -hmm. center where that's where they do the demonetization and all, all of this. So what are the things they can do? They can demonetize you, right? They can suspend a particular video, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think then gives you a strike. Or they can, clearly they can terminate your account, right? Mm -hmm. So they can do anything all kind of up to that level. Now, they used to just rely on people like flagging and reporting, which mm -hmm. is what most sites do. You report the video, you flag it, it's spam, it's abusive, it's blah. Then they check it out after that. Right. Okay. Then if there's enough of those, right, probably if there's like two or three, mm -hmm. like one, one, yeah, whatever. But if there's two or three, then it goes to a human, the person looks at it, they either say it's okay or it's not. Now, we've had some things that were demonetized right. where I put it on appeal and we got it back. Mm -hmm. So clearly in some cases it's like, okay, the human sees it and they're like, okay, there's no problem. And come to find out in June, they started implementing, and now I'm sure it's fully ramped up, uh, an, uh, an AI algorithm oh, wow. that is listening, you know, they do uh -huh. like um, uh, voice recognition. Mm -hmm. That's how, that's one of the ways that they're able to connect videos, you know, they do voice recognition. So they also, the voice recognition is now flagging. So if it sees particular terms, it'll flag it. Certain words. Certain words, uh -huh. certain combinations of words, it'll flag it and it'll send it to a human to look at, then the human does something. Gotcha. So the, the interesting thing about it is, Nothing has happened on the youtube.com slash Vin Armani account. I'm mm -hmm. expecting something to happen, right? Because the only thing that was there was clips of the show. Yeah, it's the same, basically it's the, the, the same it's content. It's the exact same content. Mm -hmm. Like it's the exact same content, the exact same words, the exact same video, the exact same audio. Crazy. Like it's no, There's nothing, it's yeah. no difference, uh -huh. right? But nothing's happened with our channel. So what's, what's the difference? Well, what I'm figuring that the difference is, is that the, they've implemented the AI on uploads, on uploaded videos, okay. but probably not on live streams. So what happens oh, with the live shit. stream is it's, it live streams it and then it archives it. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a different type of file. It's a .ts transport stream. Oh. It's a .ts file that mm -hmm. is the original file. And so what I'm thinking is that it's when they're doing the analyzation is when you upload it and it processes it, it probably analyzes it at the exact same time, and that's what's sending the flag. So we're not getting the flag on ours because it's not- it's live. Right, so it's not that there's somebody traveling around finding things, but it's almost more insidious than that, that they've said, okay, every time a certain set of words comes up, flag it and send it over. Mm -hmm. So, Occam's razor, right? All things being equal, the simplest answer is the answer. Well, what would be the video that would set it off? It would be the last video. That's yeah. what I figured. So what was the last video? And this was, this was what had me scratching my head for a few days. And I've been thinking about it, but now I think I finally got a handle on, on, on this whole situation. It's this, uh, it was the sex robot story. So on the 14th, Activist Post put up, this is the title, as robots approach object versus subject are being confused. This was actually from two weeks before. And if you'll recall on this story, 
So it says right there, in this video, Vin Armand explains how objectification and subjectification are being confused when it comes to sex robots and taxing robots. Mm -hmm. So if you remember, Christian, this was the story where we were talking about the article from Waking Times, yeah. where the woman had said, the title was something like, sex robots are the evolution of the objectification of women. Right. And where we said, we went through and broke down the fact that sex robots are objects, they're not women. Mm -hmm. You can't, up, the objectification of an object is what you do. Mm -hmm. And how the woman, one of the things that we said in there was that she, we, she had gotten this wrong and did not understand the difference between objectification, an object and a mm -hmm. human being, mm -hmm. because she was saying things like, you could rape a sex robot. Right. And even in there, I said, well, can you rape a dildo? Like you can't rape an inanimate <laughs> object. You can rape a human. Yeah. Right. Or another sentient creature, right? Mm -hmm. You could certainly abuse an animal, disgusting, right? But we, so, and what we were saying in there is that it's very important that we get these definitions correct. Mm -hmm. I also said in there that the objectification of women, that objectification, a synonym for that is dehumanization. Mm -hmm. And that the dehumanization of anyone is immoral. I just wrote a fucking book about it. <laughs> Called self ownership. Yeah, you could, you could, and if people want to get it, you could throw up that. Go ahead and throw up that URL. And while we're at it, vinarmani.com slash self ownership. Actually, I'm going to change that. Self ownership.me, people can go to. That's nice. easier. Self ownership.me. Or you could go to vinarmani.com slash self ownership. I'm sure people are looking at, at the shirts. Crypto Savage here. Boom. Yours. Crypto Savage written in a more like elite Cash. script. So. GovernYourself.com, there it is, G-V-R-N. Oh, that's wrong. You are S-L-F. I got that wrong. Oh, Govern Yourself, anyway, there's a link in the description to both things, if people wanna go check those out. Cool. You've got a whole bunch of different shirts in there, yeah. right? Yeah, and there, there's gonna be a number of new ones coming too. And pay with cryptocurrency mm -hmm. on both things. Only crypto. Only crypto, on both things. The book, where you can get the hard copy, audio book, and the digital ebook. And of course the shirts, the shirts are awesome. There's men's and women's. Uh, there's, a, there's the keep calm and avoid taxation. Yeah. I love that. There's Murray Rothbard. Mm -hmm. There's uh, Bitcoin, Cupto. Dash, mm -hmm. and Ethereum. And of course, crypto set. I mean, these are awesome. And this material is great, yeah. by the way. Like I really, I really, really like these shirts. So the sex robot story, I do believe, I believe what's happening is that Probably what they've got going on at Google is those human beings, those sensors, you would think that they would hire people who would be sort of experts mm -hmm. in what would be inappropriate, right? So if it flags, you know, if it's something about like war, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. bombing, you know, and they don't want to show graphic videos, you would think that they would have a certain set that only handle like war bombing graphic. Right. Or if it's like sexual, they have certain ones. But I'm sure because we had like the words objectification of women, rape, you know, sex, whatever, all of these, that probably those combined sent it off to, and you've got to imagine that what's in that room <laughs> is a bunch of, because who, who would want, to, who would apply for a job as a censor? Yeah, right. The same people who are deplatforming people and stopping them from speaking at universities. Mm -hmm. So you've got purple haired, third wave feminists. <laughs> That's who would find this interesting. And it was such a draconian response. Like it wasn't just taking down one video. It was like, we're taking down the whole thing. The whole channel. The whole channel. And I think that the reason why I, th I, th I thought about this. First off, let's talk about the sex robot thing. I didn't know that this was such a big deal. Like, I went into this not knowing that, like, this is a whole thing. That, mm -hmm. like, this is a whole wing of third wave feminism. Like, if you go and look, like, if you type in feminist and then you type in sex robot, like, this is a whole argument oh, shit. that they're having that we just like, we decimated. And mm -hmm. it's important, we'll talk about why that is. But what I found interesting was, I've been, this topic, there's a, there was a guy, Daniel Moxney, 
who was on like news groups around like 2003, maybe through 2005, something mm -hmm. like that. Actually, much later on, he and I actually ended up somehow becoming Facebook friends. And we would have these debates because he's a big like climate change, global warming yeah. guy. But if people go and check out, I'll, I'll put a link actually. He used to go by the Danimal on news groups. For a long time, he was my favorite philosopher. Hmm. Right. He was saying things that were like so forward, forward and future thinking. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really got him angry was, I think, one of the beginning kernels of one of the movements that is now like firmly embedded into third wave feminism. Right. Which is fat acceptance. Oh, right? Okay. He was big on talking about the interplay with between men and women and like what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And he was pretty self-deprecating about like. What are the real things going on with men and women? This is before like the MGTOW, like men going their mm -hmm. own way. It's before the men's rights movement. Uh, he, he was actually communicating in some of the forums that the news groups that were the early news groups, like uh, Alt Seduction Fast, which was like some of the beginning of the pickup artist community. Right. And actually there's this book, I, have, you know, Neil Strauss, yeah. right? And he wrote this book, The Game. Yeah. That's what kind of let people know about this pickup artist community mm -hmm. that existed in Hollywood. That, and that was the community that I was a, a part of for mm -hmm. a very long time. And it's why, you know, became a gigolo and all of that mm -hmm. off of that. So the, there's a, it, how Neil Strauss tells the story of him meeting this dude, Mystery, who was like one of the gurus. He had a reality show on VH1 yeah, called uh, The Pickup Artist. Pick ours, yeah. They did like two seasons. Strange dude. But he hmm. would give boot camps to guys. But there was this book called The Lay Guide. It was not a book. It was like a PDF that was circu circulating around. Uh -huh. And I've got a copy somewhere. I actually made it into a, a printed out book. But come to find out later on, Daniel Moxney actually had some things. They were like pulled from news groups and all of this. He used to talk about sex robots a ton. Huh. And he, had, he was specific about like sex robots will turn, will be this massive turn in terms of like all of this feminine, all these feminism tropes and any mm -hmm. power that feminism has will be immediately removed. It will take away every lever of power. Wow. Sex robots will take away every lever of power. If you think about it, it's, it's an interesting concept because it's like, if women are saying, you're objectifying women, you're, you, you can't behave this way. You think about campus rape culture, right? Mm -hmm. You think about guys scared now of like having sex with women right. on campus. Yeah. Like, if I was a dude on campus right now, a young guy in college, I would be so fucking mm -hmm. scared. Like, how do you even, because it could at any time, mm -hmm. could turn like, and just being accused of rape, whether you did it or not, and it turns out on a lot of these that they didn't do it. But whether you did it or not, just being accused of it is enough to ruin your life, you oh, know what I mean? Dude, seriously. So, this is the type of thing that, that Moxney would say. So I've, I've went back, I found some Danimal, some of the Danimal quotes. They're interesting. I mean, these were some, these are from like 2005. So this wow. is a guy, very prophetic. People want to go and check out the Danimal archives. You can sit for all day. It's kind of like these short quotes. Absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. Like I just used to sit and read them and be like, wow, this, this dude is so smart. And they're all pulled from like his responses in news groups, like back in the early 2000s. This is from like 2000. This archive is from 2005. So put up this Danimal sli slideshow. He said, so this is something talking about sex robots. He said, evolution sucks because sperm is cheap and eggs are costly. That's why I suggest we build sex robots. Let everyone act out whatever silly sociobiological urges they feel in a safe way which affects no other human. Which is pretty much what we were talking about the mm -hmm. other day. It affects right. its whatever silly sociobiological urges they feel in a safe way which affects no other human. Mm -hmm. So like, don't control their behavior. Just if you don't like whatever it is, then just have a no other human being in the room and let them do their thing. Yeah. Uh, check out this next one. I don't know what the context of this is, but the quote is, sex robots might someday be that cheap. A real doll costs about $5,000. If it lasts for 10 years and you bang it 500 times per year, that's $1 a bang. <laughs> Adding intelligence to the real doll won't increase the price very much because you're going to get intelligence for free anyway as, in, as computers continue to get better. Adding mobility would increase the price, but it's hard to say by how much. On the other hand, a mobile robot would be good for lots of things other than sex. For example, cleaning the house, mowing the lawn, guarding your property, etc. Wow. This is, he's talking in 2003. Wow. 
It's like almost 15 years ago. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so at that time, a real doll cost about $5,000. So I was interested, like, oh, is Moxney, is Moxney a bit of a profit? Is the reason why a third wave feminist censor would get so angry is because Moxney's pro prophecy is coming true? Like, mm -hmm. at what point is it cheap enough that it's a real threat? And I think we're hitting it. Go to this next one. I found these. Free shipping from China. Shit. This doll is so freaky realistic looking. People got to go and see this thing, but they could go to dhgate.com or, or Alibaba or any of these imports uh -huh. and just type in, it really says real sil silicone sex doll with a skeleton. Wow. <laughs> $362 with free shipping. That's crazy. Now this one's like still pretty creepy, I think. Yeah. Very not very thing. realistic but it's so damn cheap mm -hmm. go to this next one though i was like what the hell this one's like twelve hundred dollars again free shipping go to this next thing just to see jesus that's crazy yeah so it's getting to this point christian it's getting to this point where you've got dolls that look like this now they don't have intelligence mm -hmm. right but if you're you figure tw even twelve hundred dollars with free shipping like, if you're a young man, I think you really start to think like, man, that's like, that's like six dates. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You're like, huh, maybe the doll is just a better option. <laughs> and then I don't have to sweat it. Like, I can just have the, <laughs> and, and the thing is that like the demand for, if the demand goes, mm -hmm. if it's cheap enough and the demand is high enough, and let's say four or $5,000, you can get one that's kind of mobile. That's, I, I've thought since I read Daniel Moxney that like, this is a very, this would be a huge cultural shift. It right. would change the values of everyone. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about it is it, who it really, I don't wanna say hurts, but who it really does tip the scales in favor of men mm -hmm. in a big way because female sex, robots what a what a woman needs out of a sexual partner right is clearly different than oh, what yeah. a man needs mm -hmm. right and if you think about it right so let's say these third wave feminists are right let's say that what men really want to do what men are really desiring to do because they've internalized misogyny and all of this if what men are desiring to do is to turn women into an object, that means there would be a huge demand for turning objects into women, mm -hmm. right? A woman object hybrid, which is what those things are. Yeah. So it's like, in some ways, I think third wave feminists need to be very careful as they proceed. And it goes to, mm -hmm. it, it's funny because it ties into the censorship thing. Because now, with what YouTube has done, with taking down activist posts, it's lit a fire under my ass. Now, we're mirrored on DTube, right? Yeah. We already have, so that's good. And DTube is like peer-to-peer, -peer, it's less censorable. We already have our podcasts are now all hosted on IPFS. So that's uncensorable. Mm -hmm. The podcast run, it can be taken down from the listing in iTunes, but you can't actually take down the physical files, right? So good. So once you're subscribed, you're good to go. But now it's like, had YouTube just left it up, I would have been much less motivated. There would have been much less incentive. Mm -hmm. But now I'm taking all of our videos and I'm putting them all on IPFS, all the clips on IPFS, the player that I'm gonna embed into my site and that other people could embed and that's gonna be shareable on WordPress is gonna be hosted on IPFS nice. and the files coming from IPFS, yeah. uncensorable. Yeah, they're-, they're, they're, they're So what they're doing is by behaving this way, they're pushing people toward alternatives. Mm -hmm. They shoot themselves in the foot. And this is what Daniel Moxney was talking about mm -hmm. all the way back then, that he said, by behaving in this way, you're going to create a demand in the market. It's just economics mm -hmm. that you're going to push men 
toward real dolls. You're going to mm. push men towards sex robots. Mm -hmm. And if you're pushing people and if there's a demand in the market and if the prices can get low enough, which clearly, I mean, so in 10 years, a tenfold drop in price. Right? Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Yeah, dude. It's kind of scary, actually. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, $360 ain't shit. With free shipping to your house, mm -hmm. that's nothing. For some guy who's hard up, who can't get laid, I mean, I know this, the pickup artist community, dude, and all of those guys, guys would pay, guys would pay $5,000 for a two-day boot camp. Mm -hmm. No assurance that they would get laid. No assurance that they would even learn anything. That's how hard up and desperate. And these guys had the money. That's the other part about it. Yeah. Well, One of the reasons they have the money is they're not spending it on any women. Because <laughs> <laughs> they can't get a date. Right. What do they have to spend it on? They've got good jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, a lot of these guys are super intelligent, too. Mm -hmm. They're like computer... They're just socially awkward. Mm -hmm. So they're already the people who would be like, eh, maybe this doll thing. I don't know. So really, it's like the answer, though, is not. The answer is to stop and see what your long term behavior will be. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work that way. That's not human nature. Human nature is when you have a little bit of power and you feel yourself losing it, you go hard at the problem and oppress mm -hmm. and within that oppression that's what makes it's the oppression that people revolt against mm -hmm. it's not the system no it's not what you have in place it's you wanting to maintain power when you feel power slipping mm -hmm. and interesting so just as a little ironic side note to this whole thing so youtube banned us essentially for talking about sex robots, right? A conversation about sex robots and how you can't rape a robot mm -hmm. because you can't rape an object. Mm -hmm. You can rape a human and it's fucking illegal and it's fucking immoral and it's evil. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most evil acts, if not the most evil act that there yeah. is. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think all societies, if you don't, if your society doesn't believe that rape is pretty much the pair, it's on par with the most evil of acts. If your society doesn't believe that your society is not going to last. Mm -hmm. Like it's got to be, it's got to be horrible. Like it's got to rise to the most highest terrible level. And the fact that we say that, we say that, and that gets us banned from YouTube, right? And they say, even if they were to say, oh, sexual content, right? No, it's it. we're having an academic discussion about it, mm -hmm. and we're having a discussion about law and morality mm -hmm. and ethics. We're not getting, being sexually explicit about anything. But they, so we violated the community guidelines. One of the community guidelines is graphic sexual content. Now, some <laughs> people know that I've been spent six seasons on a reality show mm -hmm. on Showtime. It's a late night show with a rating beforehand that says mature audiences only, mm -hmm. graphic sexual situations. There's full frontal nudity, there's sex going on. The only thing you don't see is penetration. Now, I get kicked off YouTube, banned, <laughs> Activist Post gets banned from YouTube for me, Vin Armani, sitting here discussing the morality or immorality of sex robots. That's a ban. However, Gigolos, all six seasons, on demand, on YouTube, <laughs> buy full episodes from Showtime, buy completely it. uncut, two bucks a piece, on YouTube. Shit. Not only are they not censored, not only are they not banned, they are profiting. Right. On a per show, on demand basis, of me <laughs> that's crazy not just talking about sex having sex <laughs> oh shit the hypocrisy yeah. is out of control mm -hmm. out of control especially since it's a show about the objectification of men it's a show yeah. about straight male escorts 
who are asked to do and who do all kinds of crazy things that we may not even necessarily want to do to please our female clients mm -hmm. who objectify us. Wow. And Showtime gets paid per episode a percentage on it. This is the hypocrisy that cannot stand. This is unsustainable. Mm -hmm. This sort of irrationality and illogical behavior cannot stand. Because anybody can see this. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense. No. So let's get into some other things that make no sense. Let's get into how collectivism goes wrong. Let's get into how social justice has been completely corrupted. And while we're at it, let's do something controversial. Let's see if we can get sent off to the censors because I'd actually like them to watch this particular awesome. episode <laughs> of the show. So let's jump, right, let's jump right into it. Let's go news number one. Let's go here. Let's go third rail. On this show, you have never and you will never hear anything homophobic, transphobic. Why? Because... I don't have those views. Christian doesn't have those views. People are individuals. I know people who are very good friends, very good friends of every race, culture, ethnicity, sexual background, sexual orientation, gender orientation, all of the above. And look, I was raised in an environment, particularly, I, I thank the rave scene for that, I thank the electronic music scene for that, for opening my eyes in a lot of ways, as a very young person, to be more accepting of other people, their backgrounds, their behaviors. Now, one thing that is, I thought, I thought that we as a culture had decided, maybe we haven't decided this yet. You saw on that thing, the, the title of this is Born This Way. Because I thought that we had decided, speaking of sexual proclivities, perhaps people who are into dolls, what, what about people who are into dolls who are born that way, right? Isn't your sexual preference, your gender orientation as well, aren't those things that you're born with? Or are they not? Because I had thought that the whole problem, like with those, uh, those Christian pray the gay away camps, where like the Christian right had said, no, it's, it's a choice. Being gay is a choice. I thought that the whole entire argument was, you don't choose who you love. You don't choose what gender uh, more appeals to you. And I thought that the whole idea was that we were going to accept that and that we were not going to discriminate against that, right? People are born this way, right? You're born gay. You're born straight. You're born bisexual. You're born transgendered, right? Right? So here comes this story, and the reaction to it is amazing. This, is, <laughs> this story is entitled Gay Face. <laughs> this is from the New York Daily News. Controversial study scientifically supports the notion of, quote, gay face, and no one seems to be okay about it. Gay rights groups have come out against a controversial study that found that sexual orientation can be read from people's faces. The implications for personal privacy are obvious regarding research by Stanford's Yulin Wang and Michael Kaczynski. The study used an artificial intelligence facial recognition algorithm and more than 35,000 pictures of men and women in a dating site who'd identified themselves as gay or straight. The AI model correctly distinguished between gay and straight men 81% of the time and gay and straight women with 71% accuracy. In short, the study scientifically supports the notion of gay face. The study's co-authors said they were, quote, really disturbed by their findings, quote, given that companies and governments are increasingly using computer vision algorithms to detect people's intimate traits. Our findings expose a threat to the privacy and safety of gay men and women. So, Christian, let's just run this down really quick before we see what the backlash and the response was. They do a study with an algorithm. <laughs> Just like, the, just like the flagging <laughs> algorithm that's flagging voice. But in this case, they're looking through sites and they're looking at pictures that people have posted on dating sites. Hmm. They want to see if through facial matching, 
right, of maybe where your, you know, the dimensions of your face, whatnot, if they can pick, are you more likely gay, more likely straight? Mm -hmm. 81% of the time for men, accurate. 71% of the time for women, accurate. Now, there's, of course, the anecdotal, there is the gaydar, right? I think I, I tend to think I have pretty good gaydar. Yeah. I can, I can be like, oh. And living in a big city, living in Vegas, right? Besides, you know, obviously a man walking, holding hands with another man. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't need gaydar for that one, right? Right. But just somebody, and they come up and you may say, oh, well, okay, could be, could be gay. A lot of my gay friends say the same thing. They could pick him out. Oh, mm -hmm. yep, I could pick him out. Okay, yep, yep. They'll say, oh, that actor or this, what, whatever. Okay. So this is anecdotal. It's been out there in the culture. These guys say, it's, it seems like a legit study. Let's mm -hmm. see. Now, you would think if the idea is you are born either gay or straight, that means there's got to be a genetic mm -hmm. component. Yep. Right? Right. There's a genetic component. Mm -hmm. There's a component in your genes. Now, we know that there are very few things that are genetic that have just one aspect to them and that lay hidden in your genes. Mm -hmm. It usually is going to manifest in, so you have genotype, which is your genes, then phenotype, which is how you look. Mm -hmm. Right? So you would think if you're born this way, if it's really genetic, it's not so outlandish to be like, maybe it can show, could show up on the right. face. Mm -hmm. Well, your race shows up on your face. Mm -hmm. You're born that way. Mm -hmm. Your ethnicity shows up on your face, right? Your eye color is going to be determined <clears throat> by genetics, all of these things. Lots of things. Freckles. I have freckles. Right. That's going to be determined by it, right? So they go. They figure it out. And even, but even the authors say n that they have a problem not with the idea that it could, that the study is accurate, they say it's mm -hmm. accurate. Mm -hmm. They don't have a problem with that. What they have a problem with is, well, but now all these companies are using these facial recognition algorithms, like this could potentially be infringing on people's privacy, mm -hmm. right? But not that it's wrong, right? That they say our study scientifically valid it's a scientifically valid study by how you would do a study like this we're just worried that it'll be used the wrong way we find it troubling mm -hmm. that someone might be able to use this the wrong way i think that's fine but what's the response throw up this glad thing which is the gay and lesbian alliance against defamation and hrc which is the human rights council i believe is that right human rights campaign GLAD and HRC call on Stanford University and responsible media to debunk dangerous and flawed report. Here's what they said. GLAD, the world's largest LGBTQ media advocacy organization and the Human Rights Campaign, the nation's largest LGBTQ civil rights organization, today called on Stanford University and responsible media outlets to expose dangerous and flawed research that could cause harm to LGBTQ people around the world. A professor affiliated with Stanford University has published a research study that resulted in several media outlets wrongfully suggesting that artificial intelligence can be used to detect sexual orientation. Further, GLAD and HRC today urged all media who either covered the study or plan to in future coverage to include the myriad flaws in the study's methodology, including that it made inaccurate assumptions, categorically left out any non-white subjects, has not been peer reviewed, and many other issues enumerated below. Quote, technology cannot identify someone's sexual orientation. What their technology can recognize is a pattern that found a small subset of out white gay and lesbian people on dating sites who look similar. These two findings should not be conflated, said Jim Halloran, GLAD's chief digital officer. This research isn't science or news, but it's a description of beauty standards on dating sites that ignores huge segments of the LGBTQ community, including people of color, transgender people, older individuals, and other LGBTQ people who don't want to post photos on dating sites. Halloran continued, at a time where minority groups are being targeted, these reckless findings could serve as a weapon to harm both heterosexuals who are inaccurately outed, as well as gay and lesbian people who are in situations where coming out is dangerous. Let's take a look at this statement and how they spun it. So now the statement is about race. Oh, shit. Now, the question is, why, if you were going to do this study, mm -hmm. would you not include people of color? 
And there's a very, very simple reason. You need, because just like we talked about genotype and phenotype, mm -hmm. if you're going to have a baseline, you're, you're going to want to start with a subset of people who fundamentally have the same phenotype, uh, right? So you're going to want to start with one race because you're not trying to, so they could have done all black. Mm -hmm. They could have done all Asian, but it's likely that as with any dating site, the vast majority of profiles are going to be white. Mm -hmm. So you get a bigger sample size. But if you start including black people, if you start including Asians, if you start including Latinos, what happens is now you've got to account for the differences in the broadness of mm -hmm. noses, the differences in, the, the, in eyes, the differences in lips. You increase the number of variables. Mm -hmm. So because they didn't include, it's so weird. They say, this is inaccurate. This is inaccurate. And this algorithm can't predict whether someone is gay or straight because it didn't include black people. It's like, no, it can't necessarily, we don't know if it could, would have those same results if it was just black uh -huh. faces. Yeah. But maybe it would. Maybe if they did just yeah. black faces, it would have the, the same, same results. Yeah. They just never did it. So they're like, you didn't include everyone. So that means what you did with just the sample of white people is necessarily wrong. Hmm. But the idea hmm. that for them to say categorically, technology cannot identify someone's sexual orientation, period. If that's true, then you're not born this way. Because technology can sexually identify your race. Yeah. 23 and me. It can tell you every single bit of your ancestry. Mm -hmm. Where all of your ancestry comes from. It can tell, I didn't know I was Irish. But I've got Irish genes. <clears throat> yeah, that's... Born wow. that way. Brown eyes, green eyes. There's a gene for that. Yep. Technology, for that. <laughs> technology can look at that and without seeing the person, it can say what color eyes they have. It can say if they have a genetic disease, like Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. Angelina Jolie went and got checked, and that's why she chopped off her boobs, remember? Because it said that she was genetically predisposed to breast cancer. So she got a, a, a a preventative double mastectomy because she was born that way. If you're born that way, then technology can predict it. Technology can identify something that you are born with. So to say technology cannot identify someone's sexual orientation while at the same time saying you're, you're born with your sexual orientation, the fuck now? Mm -hmm. Wow. <clears throat> so my question is why, or let's, what's the common thing that allows technology to predict that or to uh, genetics? Genetics. So it's it's a factual thing. It's not a yeah. It's okay. Well, it's to say that that your, it's one of two things, right? Nature versus nurture. Mm -hmm. Either. Yeah. Either what is happening with you and something like you're, it's like this, you're either born a certain way or you're not. It's either nature or it's nurture. Now the big problem, right? This has been the biggest problem with gay rights. So you take something like gay marriage. Mm -hmm. If it's just a choice, well, we can discriminate against choices, mm -hmm. right? Like, no shirt, no shoes, no service. Yeah. That's a choice. You chose not to wear a shirt. You chose not to wear shoes. No service. Mm -hmm. Black, no service. Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. Gay, no service. Not even no service. Bake the damn cake. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. 
Right. A government office can prevent you from entering if you're carrying a firearm. They cannot prevent you from entering if you're gay. Mm -hmm. Because you weren't born with the firearm, the firearm was a choice. Yeah, gotcha. You know what's interesting too, this is kind of off subject, but I think it's something that needs to be Go talked ahead. about too. Is Go ahead. Even in a gay or a lesbian relationship, there's always a male-female dynamic. I mean, maybe. Maybe there is. Maybe there's not. But that's probably a lot less. Could that be predicted? Perhaps. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jordan Peterson's done a lot of work on temperament, right? People's temperament. And it's to say that, like, you know, the big five personality traits, you could say people are born that way. If that's the case, there's probably a genetic component, right? Yeah. Now, it may be that at this very moment, we can't see what that genetic component is. But here's what's interesting. With temperament, we actually can measure and figure out mm. what someone's temperament is by how they answer certain questions, for instance. So it's like these measurements, these measurements are possible. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. And for somebody to say, for a, a political group to say, technology cannot identify someone's sexual mm -hmm. orientation. To just, so it's not going to matter what study comes along. It's not going to matter if they mm -hmm. find a quote unquote gay gene, which these guys aren't even saying, right? They're just saying, oh, there's some similarities. Who knows where the fuck it comes from, mm -hmm. right? Who knows where it comes from? They're not making that statement. They're just saying this person identifies as gay. This person identifies as straight. 81% of the time we can tell which one they're going to do. That's high. That's a high correlation. Yeah. Now, it might be beauty standards, right? Could be. It could be grooming, mm -hmm. right? How they're grooming, especially for mm -hmm. men, how they're grooming their facial hair, for instance, could be different. Plucking your eyebrows, probably much more common shaping mm -hmm. and plucking eyebrows among gay men than it is among straight men. Mm -hmm. That could have something to do with it. Who the fuck knows? But to yeah. just out and out say, this is wrong, for political reasons, there's something, there's something fundamentally wrong with that idea. It's inconsistent. It's inconsistent with, you get one or the other. You either get nature or nurture. It's probably some combination of the two, but if you completely discount nature, like, well, now it's all nurture. Now mm -hmm. it's all a choice. And if it's a choice, you can discriminate against somebody for a choice. That's the important part. This is where the statism fucking falls apart. So, so many inconsistencies. It's always inconsistencies, mm -hmm. dude. Yeah. Let's do... You know what? Maybe we'll go... Let's do this. <laughs> inconsistencies. We can at least cover Bernie Sanders. Let's... Uh, <laughs> before we cover 2017 Bernie Sanders, crazy grandpa McFree, McFree shit... <laughs> Uh, he's now the leader of the Gives Me Dats party. <laughs> <laughs> That's the new, the Gives Me Dats wings of the, a wing of the uh, Democratic Party. Let's show 1987. This is a little hard to hear the recording, so the people who are just listening, listen carefully, we'll be quiet. This is 1987 Bernie talking about what would happen if we gave Medicaid cards to everybody. Go ahead. Well, the point that we understand that I think was, was reinforced that when, we, when we went to, uh, to Canada is that, at least as I see it, and I'm not an expert on it, but this is the way I see it. Number one, you want to guarantee that all people have access to health care as you do in Canada. But I think what we understand is that unless we change the funding system and the control mechanisms in this country to do that, for example, if we expanded Medicaid, everybody, right, give everybody a Medicaid card, we would be spending such an astronomical sum of money that, you know, we would bankrupt the nation. Okay, let me read that for those people who didn't uh, hear it. Now, remind you, uh, Bernie was probably in 1987, he was probably uh, smoking quite a bit, so we'll just say that perhaps he forgot that little statement. He said, 
If we expanded Medicaid to everybody, give everybody a Medicaid card, we would be spending such an astronomical sum of money that, you know, we would bankrupt the nation. 1987, Bernie says, if we gave Medicaid to everybody, we would bankrupt the nation. 2017, Bernie says, this is Medicare. Why we need Medicare for all, New York Times op-ed. This is Bernie Sanders. I will not read it in the Bernie voice. I will read it in the, under, the voice where you can actually understand every word. All over this country, I have heard from Americans who have shared heartbreaking stories about our dysfunctional system. Doctors have told me about patients who died because they put off their medical visits until it was too late. These were people who had no insurance or could not afford out-of-pocket costs imposed by their insurance plans. I have heard from older people who have been forced to split their pills in half because they couldn't pay the outrageously high price of prescription drugs. Oncologists have told me about cancer patients who have been unable to acquire life-saving treatment because they could not afford them. This should not be happening in the world's wealthiest country. Americans should not hesitate about going to the doctor because they do not have enough money. They should not worry that a hospital stay will bankrupt them or leave them deeply in debt. They should be able to go to the doctor they want, not just one in a particular network. They should not have to spend huge amounts of time filling out complicated forms and arguing with insurance companies as to whether or not they have the coverage they expected. The solution to this crisis is not hard to understand. A half century ago, the United States established Medicare, guaranteeing comprehensive health benefits to Americans over 65 and has proved to be enormously successful, cost-effective, and popular. Now is the time to expand and improve Medicare to cover all Americans. This is not a radical idea. I live 50 miles south of the Canadian border. For decades, every man, woman, and child in Canada has been guaranteed health care through a single-payer, publicly funded health care program. This system has not only improved the lives of the Canadian people, but has also saved families and businesses an immense amount of money. On Wednesday, I will introduce the Medicare for All Act in the Senate with 15 co-sponsors and support from dozens of grassroots organizations. Under this legislation, every family in America would receive comprehensive coverage and middle-class families would save thousands of dollars a year by eliminating their private insurance costs as we move to a publicly funded program. So Christian, the question is, the question is, is, where are you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized something. The question is this. Was Bernie Sanders high in 1987? <laughs> <laughs> or is Bernie Sanders high now? <laughs> right? Shit. <laughs> this is the question. <laughs> yeah, it's a serious question. Now, it may not be an either or. I think it may be an and. I think I found the solution <laughs> to was Bernie Sanders high in 1987? Because in 1987, Bernie Sanders cut a folk music album. <laughs> And I have a cut from that folk music album to answer, was Bernie Sanders high when he made the statement that Medicaid, would, Medicaid for all would bankrupt the nation in 1987? Bernie Sanders, 1987, debut album, do it. As I went walking that ribbon of highway, I saw above me that endless skyway. I saw below me that golden valley. And that on this earth, there will be peace, there will be justice, there will be human brotherhood. As I made fun of Christian, <laughs> uh, not Christian, of Bernie Sanders <laughs> for being high, Christian informed me that we have not been streaming on YouTube. Is this correct? Are we streaming now? Is the stream uh, button yeah, red? Yeah, it's starting now. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> so we have not been streaming on YouTube this whole time? No, but we're, we're on Facebook though. Okay, good. Yeah. So I'll have to... <laughs> Just cut it. Ah! <laughs> I'll have to put up the whole show. So that's so funny. We censored ourselves off of YouTube. <laughs> Shit. So here I am making fun of Bernie Sanders being high. And then maybe I'm high. I'm just tired. I'm just exhausted. But here we are. We're on YouTube now. We're on YouTube now. So that's good. Yeah, uh, we're good now. We're good. Well, Bernie Sanders, 1987, clearly high. The album, 
Definitely was sounds, not did not go platinum. Sounds amazing. <laughs> it went it went aluminum foil, I think. <laughs> but uh, I think I think that what we're talking about in this case is this is the run up and the, go ahead and switch over to you and I so people can see. This is now we're all discombobulated. This is the run up to Bernie Sanders as the sort of godfather he's not going to run for president again mm -hmm. but this is the godfather the there's 15 co-sponsors uh in the in the senate i know elizabeth warren is one of them there's some other people but it's all kamala harris is one of them mm -hmm. it's all the people who are potentially going to be running against donald trump so we're going to get to see the gives me that wing <laughs> the socialist wing of the democratic party I predicted this. I predicted that we would go way more socialist. That's the reaction. Mm -hmm. Here we are. I'm glad that you figured that out, dude. See if Scott Horton is ready. Cool. People will still be able to watch Scott Horton, our interview with him. See if he's ready. Let's go to break, dude. We can come back. We'll do counter markets, and then we will uh, we'll do Scott Horton. Welcome back to the Vin Armani Show. We are streaming live. Now we're streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Vin Armani. We're also live on Twitter and Periscope at Vin Armani is my handle there. And we are streaming live on the Facebook page of Activist Post. That's facebook.com slash Activist Post. So before we get to our guest in this second hour, I want to tell you all a little bit about CounterMarkets. CounterMarkets.com, trends and strategies for maximum freedom. Great issue this month. It's brand new. If you have never gotten an issue of Counter Markets, you can get your first issue for free just by going to countermarkets.com. If you have gotten your issue for free, uh, you should come and check out, get a subscription. If you pay in cryptocurrency, massive discount. This month, I'm actually really excited and proud of the issue that we put out. This is like a list issue. So mine is the top five blockchain projects that I believe will disrupt the current economy. So it's more an exploration of the ideas behind these concepts. And I think that all five of them put together represent the ideas and the concepts that are embedded in them, represent a new economy full of freedom, decentralized, and highly focused on the individual. And the wonderful thing about it is they're all here. So when we talk about censorship, like the situation that happened with YouTube, one of the things about the blockchain is it's censorship resistant. So that's not just talking about a blockchain like Steam, which is one of the ones that I find to be, it's, it's in my list of top five, where you're actually putting content up, but it's for us to start thinking about money as censorable as well. That really like the move to a cashless society is the censorship of cash. It's like burning books in Soviet Russia or Nazi Germany. It's taking cash out of circulation. So censorship resistance is what we're going for. Why is censorship resistance so important? Because now it's not just the state that's censoring. We also have these massive corporate gatekeepers. One of the things that they're censoring and one of the things that they always censor is the truth about wars, the truth about empire. And so that's what we are going to cover with our guest today, Scott Horton. Scott Horton is the author of Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, Managing Director of the Libertarian Institute at libertarianinstitute.org, host of Anti-War Radio on Pacifica 90.7 FM, uh, KPFK in Los Angeles, and KUCR 88.3 in Riverside, and also hosts his own podcast, The Scott Horton Show. He's conducted more than 4,500 interviews since 2003. Scott's also the opinion editor of antiwar.com. His articles have appeared there at lewrockwell.com, the History News Network, the Future of Freedom, and the Christian Science Monitor. Scott Horton, welcome to the Vin Armani Show. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. So I want to get into a discussion about 
something that you are certainly an expert on. That is empire, and particularly talking about the empire and the war in Afghanistan. But before we get there, you've clearly dedicated your life to this. You've dedicated your life to informing people about the American empire and about what's truly going on. What was the starting point for you? I'm always interested to know what was the thing that set you off and said, I'm going to dedicate my life to this particular form of journalism and this particular movement? Hmm. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm a skateboarder, so I've always hated cops since I was a little kid. So I'm just kind of an anti-government extremist by nature, I guess, <laughs> on pretty much any issue. And then, um, you know, I guess... <clears throat> To be perfectly frank about it, back in the 1990s, I was a New World Order kook. Hmm. And so the center of my whole conspiracy theory outlook on the world was that ultimately it was a grand design for a one world government under the United Nations and all that nonsense. Um, and then in the early part of this century with the dawn of the terror war, I realized that really wasn't right. And yet I still had learned in the background, I had still learned so much about America's foreign policy you know, in the at least in the 20th century anyway, that, um, you know, I really, part of me being a kook was that I had predicted the September 11th attack and that it would be exploited in the way that it was and all that kind of thing. I'm not alone in that at all. I'm not really patting myself on the back. I think a lot of people kind of saw it coming. Hell, they had the Homeland Security thing, you know, proposing the new Department of Homeland Security for counterterrorism before 9-11 ever even happened, you know, so they're for people who were paying attention, it was pretty clear the war on terrorism is next, even in the Bill Clinton years. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, to be honest, the lies leading up to the Iraq war were just so transparent to me. I guess I sort of felt like if other people can't really see how this is going very well, it's sort of my job to try to explain it to them and keep track of this stuff. Because it was just so blatant and so ham-handed, and yet they got away with it anyway. Mm -hmm. They were getting away with it anyway, so... I don't know. Anyway, so and also, I guess I give credit to uh, George Carlin and Bill Hicks, too, because when I was a little kid, well, not a little kid, but, you know, a teenager, um, you know, both of them really instilled not just how bogus all this was, but how bogus the idea was that you're supposed to have to believe in this if you're from here. Now, whatever the war is, hey, if, if George Bush says so, then it's great. As you know, you wouldn't agree to that on any other issue. But when it comes to attacking another country, well, then he's the leader of us all somehow, this kind of thing. And they just made it, you know, they helped to make that very apparent, just how bogus that was. And then also, I guess I give credit to G. Edward Griffin and William Norman Grigg, uh, who at that time were with the John Birch Society, because even though they were, you know, conspiracy theorists with the whole New World Order aspect and all that going on then, and still we're just as anti-war as it could possibly be. Because hmm. to them, and this is part of a good way to really understand Al-Qaeda's war against the United States, is empire is the only way to destroy America. If you hate America and you want to bring it down, the only thing you really can do is try to get it to overextend itself and you know push itself into complete bankruptcy and destruction. So... So let's let's talk let's talk about that. That let's was talk about, what they let's... thought. So they always opposed the war from the right. So I always thought that was really powerful that you have guys who are unapologetically red, white, and blue. They worship George Washington. They worship Jesus Christ. They wear three-piece suits. Mm. They own businesses. They're right wingers, and they're just absolutely as anti-war as can be, and have no apology for it. Ron Paul is the same kind of way, and I think for me in the 1990s that was really powerful that. You don't have to be a tie-dye hippie, anarcho-communist, or some kind of leftist or anything like that to be against this foreign policy. You could, you could not agree with Noam Chomsky at all and still agree with him entirely that we don't need to have this kind of imperial foreign policy. So, so let's talk about, uh, you, you mentioned empire and that Osama bin Laden's whole idea, and I've seen you speak on this, and it's fascinating, uh, that Osama bin Laden got the idea that the way to destroy the American uh, that a way to destroy America or to win a war against America is empire. I don't think that this word is spoken about often. I don't think most Americans would view America as an empire. We certainly think of the Roman Empire in the past and the, the British Empire, certainly the sun never set on it. 
Can we talk a little bit about just some basic definitions of what does this term mean as you're using it? What does empire mean? And then can we talk about what makes America an empire and why America decided to become an empire or, or what, the, who the, what the machinations of the powers that be was that got it to that place? Sure. Yeah, I like talking about that. It's really important. And, you know, as far as the bin Laden thing, I mean, and we'll get back to that, obviously, with the war on terrorism and all, but you know, America's empire was Al-Qaeda's motive to attack us, but it, then it was also their strategy to destroy us, hmm. would be to give our government an excuse to take advantage, to go and, you know, far beyond defending the United States, but to take advantage of attacks against the American people to get away with furthering their imperial agenda, which anyone who's not actually in charge of administering an empire at any given time can tell you that all empires fall, that uh, um, you know, as uh, Carol Quigley, the famous uh, history professor from Georgetown University said, world empire is the last stage of a civilization before it dies. Hmm. And that, you know, in fact, the famous book, Tragedy and Hope, he said, that's the tragedy, is that this is what always happens. But the hope is that we can be, you know, that we can learn from history and that this republic will know better than to take advantage of every opportunity that it has to expand its power and instead be, as George H.W. Bush would say but not do, be prudent and, you know, reserve your power and try to stay a limited constitutional republic as long as you can because once you embrace power, then you embrace that kind of corruption that leads to your own downfall. And so we see right now with all of our wars that there's no national interest being served, and you couldn't name a national interest being served in picking a fight with Russia and Ukraine. I mean, this is absolutely insane. But inside American imperial politics, well, that makes perfect sense. That's exactly what you have to do. Anything less than that is treason hmm. or something. But to us regular people, why in the world would we want to try to get into a border dispute with Russia 8,000 miles from here on their border, not our border? Why would we expand our empire to the degree we have a border dispute with the Russians who, as we all know, just like us, have 7,000 H-bombs? Right. 7,000. That means that I don't care what your feelings are, that's a fight you can't pick. You just don't pick that fight. And by the way, Soviet communism is gone. It's been dead for 25 years. And so now you see the American empire is dominating in Eastern Europe where the Soviet Union used to. And now we've brought even the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, right on Russia's border into our NATO military alliance and have stationed West, you know, American and other European, German, and other troops there in those Baltic states. I mean, imagine if the Russians had done that with their military alliance and expanded it into Canada and Mexico sure. and made sure to do violent revolutions and subterfuge and coup d'etats in order to make sure that they had Russia-friendly governments in Canada and in Mexico. We would go to war over that. Of course. And yet that's exactly what we do to them and act like, well, they're just going to have to take it. And, you know, this goes, so now back to your real question about just how do you even call this an empire anyway? So the deal is that we don't have colonies in the way that the old European empires did, right? Even though we basically picked up the French colonial war in Vietnam. Sure where they left off, we called it anti-communism and nothing about colonialism. We weren't trying to occupy the place and steal all their minerals, right? Right. Or something. No, we were just there to contain communism, even though we just picked up where the European empires left off. And so if you go back to the end of World War II, you see that really the whole world had burned to the ground except America. It was the only industrial power left standing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, first of all, they gave us a huge open market to the world and the ability to to force everyone to accept our imports, but they needed them anyway, especially at first. Mm -hmm. And so uh, our exports, imports to them, you understand what I mean? Yep. Uh, so it, it gave the United States, it was just, it had absolutely inordinate power compared to any other group mm -hmm. of states or anywhere on the planet. And we inherited the British, the French, the Dutch, the German empires in Europe and across the third world and the Japanese empire as well. And the Soviets and the, and the communist Chinese got the rest, basically. But we got, I mean, look, we got South Korea. That was Japan's empire. Vietnam was, you know, the French and then the Japanese empire during the war anyway. 
Um, and so all of this became America's sphere of influence, and the American people could afford it. So what happened? Well, sort of. I mean, as we all know, we went off the gold standard and all that eventually after the Vietnam War. But uh, anyway, at the time, it seemed as though that's right. We're going to we have what they now just call preeminence. It's a, just a nice word for dominance. We are the dominant power on Earth and we're going to make sure that we stay that way forever. And so they divided the world up into all these combatant commands, you know, with Pacific Command and Central Command and the European Command and all of those that now they have the new African Command and they just pretend as though the whole world is under the jurisdiction of the American Pentagon. Well, it is. And then so uh, what Gareth Porter, we have a problem, what Gareth Porter identifies as the perils of dominance. And that is that the United States military, never even mind the H-bombs, the United States military is so much more powerful than any other country's conventional force, including the Russians or the Chinese. Uh, we just absolutely dominate them by orders of magnitude. But so then that means that our policymakers mistakenly then conclude that we can do whatever we want and that it, all other countries are going to have to accede to our demands. They're going to have to give in to us. If I mean, imagine the Ewoks resisting the empire. It's ridiculous. <laughs> How could they? And so you look at the Vietnam War, where he stayed and lost for, you know, 12, 13 years. And look at what's going on in Afghanistan now. You're telling me that America, number one, yellow ribbon, red, white, and blue, F-35 fighters, and, you know, all these B-2 bombers and everything, that we have to back down and we have to lose and turn around and, and turn tail and cut and run and leave at the hands – at you know, face down beaten by the Taliban, by some Pashtun tribesmen with rifles who simply refuse to keep fighting as long as we're on their lawn. You see that instead we'll stay for 16 years before our government will go ahead and say, you know what, our Army and Marine Corps are either not up to this task or they're not the right tool for this job or whatever it is. They won't question the idea that we have to remain the dominant power in Afghanistan forever. I don't know if you saw the very latest in the New York Times by Rod Nordland there, mm -hmm. where they're expanding the size of the green zone. Right, in yes, I did see that, yes. So they can't fly their helicopters from the green zone to the airport. Right. So they've had, or they, you know, they haven't, they, I'm sorry, they haven't been able to drive their trucks back and forth. So they've been taking helicopters, helicopters everywhere to get back and forth just inside the capital city. Well, now they're going to just expand the size of the green zone to take into account all these other bases and buildings and try to eventually get all the way to the airport and then just make all of this sort of this imperial city in the center of Kabul. And, you know, we're having this conversation for future historians sure. looking back sure, on this. Sure. This is September 2017 we're talking about starting the Afghan war all over again. Right. Because it's either that or admit defeat, and the empire won't do that. And so, oh, but now, so back to the general shape of the empire. Please. All of the European states are American allies, and virtually uh, at least non-NATO allies, officially one way or the other. Uh, most of them are in NATO. There are some of the Balkans that are not yet in NATO. But they've expanded, and that's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization that was created to defend the Western democracies from Soviet communist expansionism back during when the Soviet Union existed. Mm -hmm. And now it keeps expanding and expanding and expanding further and further to the east and encircling and, you know, to limit the power of Russia. And as they openly say in their documents, if you read the think tank um, you know, platforms and policy documents and read books by people like Zbigniew Brzezinski, they say we, especially now that we're actually there in Afghanistan, we have the Bagram Air Base and other bases there that we can never leave, we can never take them out because this gives us an edge compared to Russia and China and Iran, right? So now all of a sudden we're not, this isn't about creating a democracy and helping the people of Afghanistan anymore. Now it's, well, geez, we have these sort of frenemy adversary states that uh, they're not outright enemies. I mean, China's one of our biggest trading partners, right? But uh, we have no real beef with the Russians. And, uh, you know, Iran is a whole other subject, but there's certainly no threat. And anyway, if you think of it from the point of view of the American people, well, having, if having a base in Afghanistan means that that gives us this extra leverage 
over Russia, Iran, and China somehow, well then, at the same time, you have to basically admit that means that these bases could cause trouble sure. with Russia, China, Iran, uh, these very same states where maybe we wouldn't need to have any trouble with them. Maybe we're going to end up picking a fight because we're trying to be the dominant power in Central Asia, even though we, the United States of America, we're the central part of North America, right? We're, we're from the New World, and we're trying to be the preeminent force in all of Eurasia and on a permanent basis. So now and they're not you, you had, about it more. They're saying for sure we're staying forever. So you had said that this was actually something that, in a way, Osama bin Laden predict. Do I do I have this uh, this idea right that he had almost predicted this that this that that what we are doing now was almost this guy's like laid out plan for like how what's the the blueprint for destroying America? Can you explain how that how that comes down? Because clearly, mm -hmm. as you say, we're in this part of the world where. And, and we're, we're so tied in there that it's like we're not even getting I, – I, maybe we're getting a lot of opium out of there. But it's, we're not getting any real natural resources that are, that are helping because we can't do anything there. Was this, so can you explain that? I've heard you explain this, and it made a lot of sense when you said it, how this is actually kind of what Osama was wanting the whole entire time. Right. So what he wanted was America completely out of the region. Okay. And he figured the only way to do that – was to bring us all the way in to how lure that, so how does that work yeah explain that right so um well it's hard because you can go back to world war one or world war two or what have you but it, you know in the book i try to basically just start with 1979 so in 1979 it was the aftermath of vietnam and the american people had what the washington dc called the vietnam syndrome hmm. meaning they resented that so many of their sons had been killed for nothing, that they didn't want to do wars like that anymore. They didn't want to go through the effort of containing communism. They wanted detente, and they wanted to just have no more foreign policy for a little while, you know? So brilliant geniuses, you got to give them some credit in a sick way, decided, you know what? How about instead of containing communism— We'll bait them into overexpansion, hmm. and we'll try to give them more obligations than they can hold on to. And part of that was what they at least claim now was their deliberate plot to lure the Soviet Union into invading Afghanistan. Now, at the time, Afghanistan had a sock puppet communist government, but it didn't have any large contingent, contingents of Russian troops, maybe none. Hmm. Um, and they weren't officially part of the Soviet Union, but they were certainly under Soviet, uh, you know, influence. So what happened was, on July 3rd, 1979, Jimmy Carter signed an order to the CIA, a finding, ordering them to provide aid, weapons, and money to the Mujahideen, mostly the Pashtun insurgent fighters, fighting against the communist government in Kabul. And six months later... And this is a little bit of a revisionist take on their part. Um, you know, I, well, anyway. So, Zbigniew Brzezinski, he was Jimmy Carter's national security advisor. Mm -hmm. Robert Gates, who you know as Bush and then Obama's uh, secretary of defense, back then was number two at CIA. Okay. And they put out, uh, they now both brag that um, it worked. And that the Soviets, when they invaded in 1979, that they said, aha, this is what we were trying to make happen. And Jimmy Carter, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski sent a note to Jimmy Carter saying, now we will give the Soviets their own Vietnam. Huh. Meaning a horrible, terrible, no-win quagmire of a war that they can't win, that breaks their bank, that disrupts their society back home, and all the terrible things that just the one word Vietnam had come to mean to the American people, right? It's not a place anymore. It's that thing that happened to us. Right. And so let's, let's give the Russians a chance to destroy themselves in that very same way, to damage themselves in that very same way. And if you ask the Republicans, you know, from back then, they'll say, yeah, that's right, Ronald Reagan, he's the one who destroyed Soviet communism. Right. And this is how he did it, is that Jimmy Carter and then Reagan inherited the policy soon thereafter and continued it, that... He broke their bank by back in the Mujahideen, in the Afghan war, in the Mujahideen. They made uh, Rambo 3 out of it and everything. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they'll add in nuclear brinksmanship and that kind of thing. And that this is what finally um, 
you know, broke the Soviet Union was when Reagan abandoned detente and went back to brinksmanship and Cold War. And that that is what finally won it. Well, the point is that the Mujahideen learned that same lesson, too, that they had brought down the Soviet Union, which, you know, in terms of landmass is the biggest world empire ever. I don't know if the British ever controlled that much area at once. Anyway, I mean, anyway. So you can see how powerful the Soviet Union was, the godless, atheist, communist, evil empire, mm -hmm. and the, Mujahid the Mujahideen with some AK-47s and some faith in God and a little bit of help from the CIA had destroyed them. And so their idea was, now let's do that to America. And I quote in the book a uh, uh, part, I'm sorry, I'm trying to watch the clock here. No, um, t take your time. Man. Eric Margulies, who is a the great reporter, foreign correspondent for the New York Sun, or uh, pardon me, the Toronto Sun for many years. Um, he, uh, in 1986, he met with Abdul Azam, who was basically bin Laden 1.0. He was the guy who helped set up the uh, Arab effort to back the Afghan Mujahideen in the 1980s. And after he was killed, bin Laden ended up taking over his group is what really became al-Qaeda when they merged with Egyptian Islamic Jihad later on. But anyway, um, at the time, Eric Margulies met with Abdul Azam, and this is in 86 now, right? So three years before the war ended. Okay. And Azam says, as soon as we're done with the Soviets, we're coming after you, the American empire, or the, you American imperialists, and we're going to liberate the Saudi Arabian Peninsula from you, and then on to Jerusalem. Huh. And, and Eric Margulies, he was, you know, an army veteran during uh, the Vietnam era, I believe, uh, born in New York, an American patriot for sure, and, and he couldn't believe it. And he's told me this story on the radio a few times, that he thought, well, what do you mean, empire? He had only ever heard pro-Soviet communists huh. call America an empire. Hmm. That's absurd. We're not the English. We're the Americans. We're the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the red, white, and blue. We don't conquer countries. We liberate them. Look at France. Look at Japan. Look at how we are. We're the good guys. And, and in fact, we're here in the middle of helping you fight the Soviets. So what the heck do you mean that we are the imperialists and you're coming for us next? And Abdul Azam said, look at it. You have your bases already. You're colonizing the Arabian Peninsula mm. and Arab lands. And look at your support for Israel and their occupation and the taking of the capital city of Jerusalem, of the Palestinians on the West Bank. And Margulies, you know, slowly dawned on him that this was really right. And now here's the thing, too. Assume for a minute that it's really true that, you know, as these men brag, that they were the ones who lured the Soviet Union into invading Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And I, the reason I say that is, when I, this is what I meant when I was saying it was kind of a revisionist take. The communist government in Kabul was a disaster. And the Soviets wanted to kill the guy and replace him, the dictator in charge. And they did immediately. As soon as they invaded, the KGB just took him out back and shot him and put a new guy in charge. Um, and so, you know, the argument was that they had enough problems and their own reason to send in troops and change the regime in Kabul without America really baiting them into it. But anyway, at least the Americans were trying, and so the lesson for you and I is still the same. For you and me, is still the same. So, um, but here's the thing. Uh, lost my train of thought, but I'm going to pick it up in just a second. Oh, so, so in 19, in, on Christmas 1979, when the Soviet Union did invade Afghanistan, then Jimmy Carter used that as the excuse to announce the Carter Doctrine huh. that said, you know, we already have this alliance with Saudi Arabia, but now we're cranking it up to 10. And now, you know, we're claiming that America will be the single dominant preeminent force in the Persian Gulf. And that includes Persia, Iran, and that includes Arabia or certainly the Soviet Union, that the Carter Doctrine is the Persian Gulf belongs to us. And this was supposedly based on their fear that, oh, no, an expansionist Soviet Union has just invaded Afghanistan. Maybe they'll invade Iran next, even though they were the ones who had just baited them into it in the first place. All right. So now fast forward to the late 1990s. I'll skip the politics here unless you want me to go back. But Saddam Hussein, after fighting, well, no, sorry, through the 1980s, I should say, Ronald, and Jimmy Carter started this policy, too. Ronald Reagan picked it up, and that was backing Saddam Hussein's invasion of Iran and war against Iran right. throughout the 1980s, also ended in 1989, and is approximately a million killed, half on each side. 
And it was a horrible war that ended in stalemate. And America eventually backed both sides of the war. Of course, you're familiar with the Iran-Contra scandal right. when Ronald Reagan was selling missiles while well, having the Israelis sell missiles to the Iranians for him. But really, most of the aid went to Saddam in that war. Well, at the end of that war, he was broke, and politics, politics, he invaded Kuwait. And that became the excuse with the Soviet Union, because this was in the summer of 1990. The wall had already come down. Right. Eastern Europe was free. The Soviet military and Russian military was being pulled back. And the Soviet Union itself wasn't gone anymore, but the Cold War was over, and they were certainly no longer an obstacle to American power in the Middle East. And so George H.W. Bush, uh, Bush Sr., took full advantage of the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, which really his government had basically told Saddam, go ahead, what the hell do I care if you invade at least the northern half of Kuwait, and then only changed their mind when he went all the way and, and seized the whole country. Um, and they used that opportunity to expand America's military footprint into Saudi Arabia in order to wage that war against Iraq. And then when the war was over, the troops stayed in order to continue to contain right. Iraq and Iran both, what they right. called dual containment. And this was truly the policy that turned Ronald Reagan's Mujahideen, uh, the Arab Afghan Mujahideen that had gone to fight with CIA help against the Russians in Afghanistan in the 1980s. This is what made them turn on us, especially bin Laden himself and then his associates in Egyptian Islamic Jihad as well. And this is where their war against the United States started. And, you know, a perpetual, unconditional American support for Israel's domination and occupation and military rule over the Palestinians on the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, as well as at that time, their 18 year occupation of southern Lebanon, mm. which only ended in the year 2000. All of that were cited over and over and over again by bin Laden as one proof that America was really already at war against them and reason causes belly, you know, from their side to say that they're fighting a defensive war against us and that they have the right to use violence against us to defend themselves. And then three, as you're really getting to his idea which is plain and he stated over and over and over again, including, you know, in published sources before the September 11th attacks ever even happened, that his plan was to lure the United States into invading Afghanistan, to recreate the heroic victory against the Soviet Union, against the United States this time. And to them, it didn't matter how many Afghans died in the war. If another million Afghans died, the Soviet war killed approximately a million people hmm. in Afghanistan in the 80s. If that happened again, oh, well, you know, don't worry, God will take care of him, I guess, was the theory. But that in the end, uh, even though bin Laden, I'm sure, didn't think that he would ever live to be the king or anything like that himself, they're playing the long game to try to get the American empire to bog itself down, to bleed itself to bankruptcy, break its military on the rocks of Afghanistan, and then go whimpering home back to North America. And then that way they can get away with all their local revolutions. Mm -hmm. So... Then the punchline is, of course, that America didn't just invade Afghanistan and stay forever to wage war there, but they also invaded Iraq and they also overthrew the government in Libya and they did a half a regime change where they outright back, and this is also true in Libya, but in Syria for years and years, they outright were providing direct aid and comfort to Al-Qaeda in Syria, the Jabhat al-Nusra uh, under Jolani and also Arar al-Sham. And I guess I can't say that I know for a fact that CIA gave guns directly to al-Nusra, but it doesn't matter. Right. They supported their entire revolution the whole time. All the guys that they trained would either go over to Nusra or ISIS, whatever. And this is what ended up leading to the rise of the Islamic State in eastern Iraq, uh, pardon me, in eastern Syria and western Iraq. Um, and so, and then of course the the horrible drone war in Yemen, mm -hmm. the Ethiopian uh, U.S. backed and and ordered Ethiopian regime change and subsequent war in Somalia since 2006. All of these are just Bill Clinton. Uh, Bill Clinton. I keep doing that. <laughs> All of these are just uh, Osama bin Laden's dreams come true, far beyond what he could have ever imagined the Americans would be stupid enough to do, and that is because. He, it's, the action is in the reaction. That's what Saul Alinsky, the leftist radical, says. The action in asymmetrical political action, whether it's terrorism or, or something less, is in the action of 
the opposition. So if you're a tiny group of, of Mujahideen, I mean, literally Al-Qaeda at the time was, at the time of September 11th, was only 400 guys. Mm -hmm. So if you're a tiny group of basically one, one or two special forces units and you're trying to take on the world empire, then how do you do it? Well, you trick them. And by trick, I mean us, you, you know, the population of the country. Mm. You give their government an excuse, something to take advantage of to, to basically overdo it and, for the Ameri and get the American public behind it. And then so, you know, it's taken longer maybe than bin Laden would have expected to break America's treasury completely. But I don't think there's any question. I mean, I think uh, you could find two a man at any think tank in New York or D.C., and they would agree that America's imperial power in the world now is waning, mm. that George Bush basically blew America's entire war wad in Iraq, and you know his, all the inflation that they created to pay for that war ended up creating the massive global, in fact, financial crisis, which also helped you know, destabilize the Middle East uh, even more along bin Laden's lines. And um, and now, you know, it's constantly described, even in the national interest or the American interest or in foreign affairs, they use language like it's the American empire is lashing out hmm. in its decline. Hmm. I mean, this is exactly what I personally and a lot of other wise people, no, I'm not calling myself wise, but a, a lot of people I was mimicking at the time, really, people like William Norman Grigg, people like Ron Paul were saying, don't do this. This is what they're trying to get us to do is destroy ourselves. And we're doing it. Why? So why is so we're in all of these other places now. But yet it seems that that you you have a, an idea or a, a belief that there's something about Afghanistan. There's something about us staying there. That is it a symbolic representation? Is there something deeper than that that I'm missing? Why is it important that Afghanistan in particular that we get out of there and not say take troops out of Iraq, not say take uh, you know stop backing the people in North, the Kurds in northern Syria or whatever it is? Why is Afghanistan that kernel that's so important for us to get out? Well, no, I mean, I, I absolutely think U.S. should get out of everywhere immediately, and especially Eastern Europe. If there's one place, you, mm. you know, that's the most important thing, it's to kick all of Eastern Europe out of NATO and say, sorry, that was Bill Clinton, George Bush, and Obama thought that, but America doesn't think that. Not anymore. You are outside of our protection. Sorry. It's not like the Russians are coming for him anyway. The whole thing is bogus. But that is the world's greatest crisis right there, absolutely, you know, by a million miles, America's relationship with Russia. In fact, nothing else in the world matters at all, right? Like mm. not even your kids. Mm -hmm. Nothing else matters compared to America's relationship with Russia. We have to get along and be friends at least until they get rid of the H-bombs, which right. at this point is going to be another 100 years or so. So that's that. I mean, the, if you're asking why did I write this book, it's because I got stuck on Chapter 2. <laughs> I'm trying to write a book about the whole stupid terror war, and I ended up bogged down in the Afghan quagmire, so to speak. And, you know, I got to where it was just so long, and I wasn't anywhere near done telling the story yet that I finally realized that, all right, well, I guess it's just going to be its own book. So what's now Chapter 1 getting into this mess was previously Chapter 1 for the whole book. And I ended up cutting out the Iranian Revolution, the Iran-Iraq War, and the first Iraq War hmm. all got cut out of that first section. So I could just try to – I still leave in some Iraq stuff because I'm trying to explain how America's Gulf War one and a half through the Clinton years was really the motivation for the, for the Al-Qaeda War against the United States uh, as waged from Saudi Arabia there. Um, but otherwise, I cut a bunch of stuff out of the first section and then – I just kept writing the Afghanistan thing until finally, you know, I caught up with the present day, basically. So it's from, sort of a history. So from the imperialist side, we're still in Afghanistan. We're sending more, I'm say we, they're sending more troops. What, what is the, because I've never heard what victory looks like. Like, I've never, ever heard that. And I'm sure as you've, as you've studied this, as you look through is there even a, are there people who are who actually believe that victor some sort of idea of victory is possible in Afghanistan and if no. so what does okay so so what the hell are we what the hell are we doing we're spending more money what is even are, are there short term goals or there long term goals can you help us to understand what's even 
what even the idea of an end is in their mind as they expand this out? Man, you know, this is going to be disappointing probably to you, but the truth is that what the, what the question you just asked me is exactly what Barack Obama was saying to his generals, hmm. is exactly what Donald Trump and previously Stephen Bannon have been saying to their generals. What are we doing there? Who are we fighting? Who is the enemy? Why are they our enemy? What, <laughs> you know, the New York Times said, Oh, you know what? Somebody brought up that there's some minerals there. And that got Donald Trump's attention because, you know, he'd really been working hard looking for a reason to stay. Hmm. He, couldn't, he kept saying to McMaster, tell me a reason why we got to stay. And McMaster kept saying, well, I don't know, because I want to. And then he kept going, well, come on, man. I got to be able to tell the people something. Huh. So all of this is what the Pentagon themselves call, it's their phrase, a self-licking ice cream cone. Once you create the thing, it doesn't matter. There is no reason. You know, you're thinking like an American citizen using your imagination that if you were in power, you would be trying to look at it from the point of view of America's national interest. But, of course, the great libertarian insight is there's no such thing as that. Right. Not, not once you're in power anyway. Right. Now there's just your interest. Right. So it's in the interest of the Army and the Marines and the Air Force to keep fighting. It's in the interest of the CIA's paramilitary division uh, and, and all the different levels of the special operations guys. There are whole divisions of the State Departments. There are, you know, unending NGOs and all of that. And then you have the defense firms. You know, I tell the story, and this is just a tiny microcosm. I mean, this, I, I really should focus more on Lockheed and General Dynamics and Northrop Grumman and their influence. And that's in the book, too. But this, to me, I think is... It's not like this is the key to the whole thing, hmm. but it provides a lot of insight to okay. me where you had a situation where the Afghan defense minister's son ran his own little Blackwater protection mercenary mm -hmm. racket. And his specialty was hiring the Taliban to drive and provide protection for the NATO convoys what? being, you know, delivering troops to, yes, and I mean, America has been paying taxes to the Taliban to allow us to travel, uh, oh you know, God. to bring our goods and supplies through their territory all this time, right? This whole time have been paying them taxes. Because think again where Afghanistan is. It's the size of Texas. It's landlocked in Central Asia. Hmm. We got to get from the port of Karachi up through the Khyber Pass to get into Afghanistan. And then that's up, you know, in the kind of northeast of the country almost. Then it's got to get all the way back down to the south again and everything. So for years and years and years, America has been paying hundreds of millions of dollars to the Taliban for protection. In some cases, when it gets to the argument ad absurdum in practice on the ground, you literally have Taliban providing the armed protection for the NATO troops, their food, all their weapons and supplies and everything else. Now get this, the son of the defense minister who was working with the Taliban to provide American to provide protection for the American uh, supplies actually opened up a lobbying firm on K Street in Washington D.C. where he could help lobby to keep the war going longer <laughs> for his own little protection racket. So, I guess my theory is that at the top you have these theories of dominance and preeminence and imperial this and that, and then below that you have. 10,000 little parochial interests of separate bureaucrats and bureaucracies and then the connected firms that do the contracting for them. And I should add that, as Nick Terse uh, points out in his great book, The Complex, you can't call it the military-industrial complex anymore because there's too many dashes. Right. It's the military-industrial, scientific, academic, every kind of business from tube socks to shoelaces to um, toothpaste and Everything in the world, our entire economy is so absolutely distorted hmm. by militarism and by military spending. I mean, the truth is capitalism works well enough that if we just abandoned it, we could adjust very quickly. Markets would adjust very quickly to all the new labor and all the new brilliant scientists who would now be you know, doing productive things for a living and all of that. That much is true. Um, but it would be one hell of a crash. I mean, you got to admit, it be, our, our economy is completely distorted into this kind of permanent warfare. 
So it would take really, I think, a President Ron Paul, someone who was willing to say, you know what, I don't give a damn. Admiral, I said sail home. That's mm -hmm. it. Uh, or you're relieved of command. The empire's over and, and we're not doing this anymore. And then he would also, of course, be willing to go ahead and have a crash and not bail out the banks and not inflate money and do a bunch of QE in order to keep everybody whole. He would say, let's end the empire. Let's go ahead and have that recession. And then let's get back on our feet with a real free market and sound economy based on, you know, sound principles of, well, sound money. So not to repeat myself too much, sorry. So clear, uh, clearly we have, but clearly we have the opposite happening, and I'm interested to get your your opinion on on that fact before we go. Going back to the Afghanistan war, I remember Donald Rumsfeld standing up at all of those briefings, talking about how the military was going to change. You know, we clearly went to drones and whatnot. That was a the, the Obama specialty. And now, but now I see with this ramping up of, of North Korea, and I'm interested to get your opinion on this, we're certainly hearing bellicose talk at the UN. I wouldn't be surprised if Trump's speech at the UN was basically the, the declaration of war, for lack of a, a better term, uh, that's going to happen against North Korea. We're seeing them flying F-35s and, and bombers yesterday over the Korean peninsula. It's looking like Cold War military industrial complex spending again. It's not this lean, mean guys out. We're here in Vegas, guys out flying drones out of, out of little air conditioned trailers out on Nellis Air Force Base. It's not that. We're going back to what I remember as a kid. I'm interested to get your, your opinion. It seems like they're accelerating this thing. Is, is this really going to happen? Like, is this going down or is this all, do you think that this is all just a puppet show and that it's again about getting some spending to the Lockheeds and the, the, you know, the Raytheons of the world? Yeah. Well, you know, I don't think that, well, I think no on both of those. I don't think that we're really going to have a war with Korea. I sure hope not. I mean, it seems like the entire Army and Marine Corps, I don't know about the Air Force, but the entire Army and Marine Corps have got to be saying hell no. Right. I mean, all that means is my men dying. That's the way they put it. They don't, you know, um, they, they better have a real good reason if they're going to want to do something like that. Then again, if he tells them to do it, Trump tells them to do it, they'll do it. Um, but I'm sure that they must be. I, I, I guess we already know from some reporting that Mattis uh, is advising him that, you know, there basically is no military option. That's what Stephen Bannon, in fact, said in one of his first interviews right. after, uh, you know, basically getting kicked out of there was that there absolutely is no military option for Korea. Uh, the fact of the matter is the capital city of Seoul of South Korea is just south of the DMZ and the North Koreans have you know, tens of thousands, I don't know the exact number, but literally tens of thousands of concrete emplaced artillery tubes and rockets to basically level Seoul. And you have not just Americans, but all their families there. You know, the Americans uh, encourage the Air Force and the Army guys to bring their families with them to Korea. So all their lives are forfeit, 30,000, 35,000 troops, and then plus all of their families and all that would be up for grabs. And it would probably take a nuclear assault on the north to try to take out all of that. Um, you know, I don't think they have, I don't know what, how many bunker busters they have or think they have non-nuclear ones that they think that they could take out all that artillery with in any kind of reasonable period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and then God knows what, you know, mission that they might have dreamed up for trying to do a decapitation against the leadership there. When we saw how well that worked against Saddam Hussein, when they just killed a bunch of innocent people at the Doha farm uh, at the start of Iraq War II, and he lived for another year and a half after that. Um, so, um, yeah, no, I mean, it would be absolutely a catastrophe. But then again, and yeah, I mean, I'm sure that Lockheed and all them love this. I don't want to acquit them in any way, but I don't think that that's really the dominant uh, question in terms of the policy. I think it goes back to, again, what... Gareth Porter says, the perils of dominance. We're us and you're just you. How could you dare resist us or dare defy our will when we boss you around? That kind of thing. And, you know, this is something that actually really bothers me a lot because, um, you know, it sounds like it should be a lie, but I think it's really right. Um, as John Kiriakou, he's a former CIA analyst and actual spy out there in the world as well. And I interviewed him the other day and he talked about how you know, like in 2002 or three, 
you would have these very high level CIA operations guys saying, yeah, you know, we got to go get Saddam's nuclear program, got to have this war because Saddam's making these nukes. And that there was basically no one among them who had any institutional memory. They had all only been mm. recently assigned to this. They came from different places. They didn't really know. And it's the kind of thing where anybody who'd been reading The Nation or I don't know, whatever, anything, anybody who, who really knew anything from just open source media trying to find out as much as possible about the Iraq weapons programs from the 1990s or 2000s could have told you that that's complete nonsense. That's complete nonsense. And yet for those guys, there's basically not anyone there who can give them the proper context. So it at least raises the question, right? that maybe in the War Council no one is there who even knows to say that, look, Mr. President, the first thing we got to understand is this is all George W. Bush's fault. Hmm. We had a perfectly good deal with Korea. They're, yeah, they're jerks. They're dictators and murderers and whatever, but they're politicians. But they're not crazy. They absolutely can be negotiated with. And we had a perfectly good deal before John Bolton and George W. Bush screwed it up hmm. and literally pushed them to nuclear weapons, did everything they could to try to get them to withdraw from the nonproliferation treaty. Mm -hmm. And then I guess they thought they were going to have a war before the consequences got out of hand. And yet they didn't. They got bogged down in Iraq and North Korea got nukes anyway. Mm -hmm. So all they did was break the deal and and put the government in this situation. And then Barack Obama, of course, did nothing but say China handle it and right. then, you know, make some provocative moves in terms of um, you know, military exercises and all those things. And as you mentioned, the, B, the B-1 the bomber flights, I mean, this is something that Obama did all the time. And, you know, uh, John McCain just threatened North Korea with extinction about a week and a half ago. But Barack Obama talked about them like that, too. And I don't think extinction was the exact word, but something like completely obliterate them off mm. the face of the earth or whatever, you know, kind of like phrase. So, um, you know, the whole crisis is really the USA's fault. And... And in fact, see, here's the thing of it, too. Regular people will form an opinion about this and back up the government. Well, I guess we have to have a war against Korea. I keep hearing that. It's people crazy. Say, yeah, That's you know, insane. I agree with you. You've got to get out of Afghanistan. But Korea, man, we're going to have to do something no. about that. But yeah, but don't you know that the Koreans just said the other day they're perfectly happy to negotiate even their nuclear weapons, huh. even their nuclear weapons, if we will agree to some of their demands. And then, but what are their demands? That we all have to kill ourselves or convert to Islam or something? No, their demands are that we stop practicing to invade their country twice a year with these full-scale military exercises, that we stop threatening them, that we stop flying our B-1 nuclear H-bombers over their country that we've already completely burnt to the ground once. Um, a lot of people don't know that, mm -hmm. but the, the first Korean War was an absolute genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a quarter or more, fifth of their population or a quarter were killed in that thing, burnt to the ground, burnt the whole country to the ground with napalm uh, long before Vietnam. And and uh, and then I, I don't even think they asked for a security guarantee, like a promise to not attack. They just said, back off. They didn't say you have to withdraw all forces from the Korean Peninsula. They're not making crazy in you know demands, poison pill demands. Their demands are perfectly reasonable. Right. Hey, let's negotiate based on you guys back down a little bit which is perfectly appropriate. Huh. And in fact, think of it this way. If it was Ron Paul and he just said, well, screw this. I don't, I'm lifting all sanctions. I refuse to enforce any sanctions. I want to be friends. I'm sending Dennis Rodman and the <laughs> Symphony Orchestra and whoever <laughs> their party. Uh, I'm, I'm sending my ambassador, if you'll right. have me, to open up an embassy there and hopefully we can immediately get started on talks for a permanent peace. Because, mm -hmm. of course, I, I, hopefully everybody knows we still only have a ceasefire. From right, 1952, right. 1953, right. we don't have an official end of the Korean War. That's right. So we, we have all, not even an armistice. You know, we just have a ceasefire deal. So let's have a permanent peace. We'll give you a security guarantee. We have no reason to attack you. We're not going to attack you. We're going to stop training to attack you because why would we need to? And that's it. And, geez, we'd really like if you guys would give up the A-bombs while we're at it. Right. I bet you could get a deal right there. I bet you could. And, and certainly you'd be in a lot better position than the one our government is putting us in now. Mm. And and for that matter, putting the Japanese and the Koreans in, which reminds me one more thing to say here. Please. This article in the L.A. Times, it'll trip you out. I'll find you the link if you want. I'll send it to you. Yes, we'd love it. Um, 
guy wrote an article in the LA Times. He was a think tanker from the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And he and I'm certain that this represents the thinking of a lot of people in D, in uh, New York and D.C. And he said, yes, you're absolutely right, Scott Horton. We could have a permanent peace deal with North Korea. We don't have to have this brinksmanship at all. We could work things out. But there's a real problem with that. And that is that then we wouldn't have North Korea to hold over the head of Japan and South Korea. Mm. And then they might spin off from our imperial orbit, mm. declare their independence without that threat to keep them corralled, and then heaven forfend, end up in, under the dominance of China. Mm. And so it's better to have this level of nuclear brinksmanship with, you know, hey, you they, they're the ones who say he's crazy. That's why they can't deal with him. But right. that would be a reason why he might use nukes, even if he really right. shouldn't, right? right? And they keep provoking him. Donald Trump is saying that, you know, uh, you know you'll know you face uh, hellfire and fury like has never been seen before. Well, America's used nukes before. That's exactly what I said when I heard that. <laughs> yeah, exactly so, what I said. Um, he's talking now we're definitely going for fusion, not just fission. Right. Um, you know, and then, but this is preferable to South Korea and Japan declaring independence from the American it's empire? Crazy. Not to me. Crazy. Scott Horton, I think we're going to have to leave it there, but that's incredibly powerful. Thank you. The book, Fool's Errand, Time to Leave Afghanistan. What, what is the, the subtitle? Is Time to End the War in Afghanistan. You can get that at foolserrand.us, uh, of course, and, and check you out on the radio as well as antiwar.com. Scott, thank you so much for being on. We'll have to have you on again as things shake out and you can sort of give us the historical context and tell us what's going on. I've learned a ton today, so I really appreciate you being on and we'll definitely have you on again. Happy to do it anytime. Thanks again for having me. Thanks so much, Scott. So Christian, see, it's so interesting to me that as we now have moved like 20 years on of this whole thing, and people don't know, like, I'm, I, I realize, like, I was there and I remember following mm -hmm. it, but there's so much about what happened, even when we were adults, that, like, we didn't know. There was no way to know. Yeah. Like, about what the truth mm -hmm. was of the war. And now to learn that it's, it's, wow, it's, that was... it's so much deeper. It's so much deeper. Like, I, I'm, this, is, this book I'm definitely reading. I'm definitely reading Fool's Aaron. Yeah, I got to go back and watch that again, too. There were so many golden nuggets there. Dude, it's, it's so amazing. This is the whole entire, this is the reason why when we talk about the state, right? And I think, mm -hmm. and for those people who have, were not able to see, here's the YouTube thing. I was thinking about this earlier today. You know, we tend to think of the state as the government. Yeah. But as he said, you know, it's not the military industrial complex anymore. It's the military, industrial, yeah. scientific, mm -hmm. academic. You throw in media, you throw in technology. Wherever there's a lever of power, psychopaths will go for that lever of mm -hmm. power. And I think that the real places where change can occur, government is no longer in control. Like, what we understand to be government. Right. But they're so intertwined and so connected. So it's to be like, is Google the government? No, not really. Mm -hmm. But is Google lobbying the government? Yeah. Hell yeah, they Absolutely. got lobbyists. Yeah. Is there, are, are senators and whatnot able to speak to somebody at Google? Absolutely. Do you think the CIA doesn't have ins at Google? Absolutely. Do you think the NSA mm -hmm. doesn't have direct ties and working on projects with Google? Absolutely. Defense Department? Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's and Facebook. We know that about Facebook, mm -hmm. CIA there. Facebook is the largest surveil public surveillance project ever enacted. Mm -hmm. it, people Facebook just is Big Brother. Yeah, they just submit their info right onto it. <laughs> and Mark Zuckerberg is going to run for president. Jesus. <laughs> then it's really locked in. Yeah, no kidding. So this is the reason why creating alternatives because if this is the end of the empire, if the empire is about to go down, then it's now is the time to create alternatives. And I think this thing with activist posts, YouTube being censored, and I'm wondering, so this is the first time that we have failed to press the stream button on YouTube mm -hmm. in 47 episodes, 47 weeks of this. It's almost coming up on a year. Yeah, October 20th. First time we failed to do it. Now, what's interesting is, 
If I go and I upload the first hour, it's going to get flagged because the flag is on the upload. Isn't it crazy how... Like <laughs> if I I was thinking about that, it yeah. just popped into my head just now. Like maybe I'll save it. Maybe I won't, I won't upload it. Right? Maybe that one goes off into the ether. I'll definitely put the first hour of the show and the whole show up on my site. And that little clip where we talked about what happened there, I think that's a good one to put on IPFS. Mm-hmm. For sharing and embedding and hopefully activist post will put that up as well they could definitely get it on the podcast though what do we got for time uh 54. let's do this i've got some just talking about the state and to finish this out interesting stories that i don't want to skip over because again it goes principles and preferences and when you allow the state into your life as you were saying people just give it to facebook Mm -hmm. well we've People are certainly giving up their rights. Mm -hmm. The alternatives are where we want to go to is decentralized with the individual in control, maximum amount of human liberty. Because when you don't have that, you allow a state and the state that starts off the smallest will grow into the biggest. The US started as one of the most, the constitution as it sits at the time was the most limited government that had ever been the most restricted government that had ever been in the history of mankind. And now it's the greatest empire that's ever been. Mm -hmm. It's important to remember that for those people who are like minarchists, you know what I mean? Who think, oh, we are a night watchman state. Yeah, right. So weed has, of course, been a big one. Let's just uh, let's cover this and then we'll we'll take off. Let's look at this Hawaii weed because this is a very interesting story. This is a story out of Hawaii. Medical marijuana. Where is it? Here we go. Hawaii becomes the first U.S. state to go cashless for marijuana sales. Hawaiian state officials announced Tuesday that Hawaii will be the first state to require the sale of marijuana to be cashless, paid with a special debit card system, a debit card payment system next month. This is from, uh, well, that's from Civil Beat. This, this is the story from Activist Post. October 1st, quote, October 1st is our target date to try to go cashless as much as we can, Ira Cicada, the state's financial institutions commissioner, told reporters at a news conference. While marijuana is is legal for medical use in Hawaii, the feds still consider it a Schedule One drug. This status has brought problems for many banks and credit unions, which is the reason why cannabis dispensaries have been cash only. The governor of Hawaii, David Ige, has praised the cashless move, stating, This cash-free solution makes sense. It makes dispensaries finances transparent, and it makes it easier for the patients who are being served. Instead of cash, customers will have to download and install CanPay, a mobile app that processes payment for medicinal marijuana shops using a Colorado-based credit union, Safe Harbor Private Banking. So Christian, here's your cashless society. So it's like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) now, so not only are you gonna be taxed and regulated, but a former business that was generally cash only, right? So it's again, like now you can't even pay cash. What I find interesting about this, if you pull out a dollar bill, it says this is legal tender for all debts, public and private. It's actually, if the government says no, you can't accept cash. Mm -hmm. The government's actually breaking legal tender laws. Jeez. Yeah. But it's all to track finances because they Mm want to get, be sure to get paid. And I'm sure that Bitcoin, and this is also, you know what this also does. If you make a law saying it has to be this one system, cryptocurrency cut right out. Crypto savagery can't even get in, in the places where it would. Hawaii's not only that for medical marijuana, not only, not only will you be paying with the mark of the beast in Hawaii, yeah, seriously, but look at this Hawaii gun thing. I didn't even know this. Hawaii denies gun permits to medical marijuana patients. Hawaii is discriminating against cannabis users that own guns. They have openly stated that people registered in their medical cannabis program cannot obtain a permit to legally acquire guns in the island state. 
Hawaii issues annual permits to acquire an unlimited number of long arms, rifles and shotguns, while single-use permits are issued to acquire some specific type of handguns. In 2016, 10,793, which is 52.7% of the permits issued were for long arms, while 9,695, or 47.3%, uh, were handgun permits. Their data showed that 42 of the 328 denied applications were specifically for the applicants being medical marijuana patients. That's 12.8% of the denied permits. Only mental health issues had more denials at 69 or 21%. Uh, percent. They will, in fact, not allow a registered patient to obtain a permit for a full year after their medical marijuana card expires. The report states, former medical marijuana patients can successfully apply one year after the expiration of their medical marijuana approval cards. One of the reasons for the doubling of the annual rate of denied applications is a recent change in the federal form that is required by federal authorities. It now specifically mentions state legal marijuana, which it did not before. Tom Engel at Mass Roots reports, earlier this year, the Bureau of Alcohol, Alcohol Tobacco and Firearms and Explosives, ATF, updated Form 4473, which must be completed by people purchasing guns from licensed dealers, to make it clear that even state legal medical marijuana use is disqualifying. This is the type of thing, Christian, that people should think about when they say, oh, I want the government to be in control of all of medicine. It's not just gonna be medicine. Yep. They're gonna tie lots of other shit to that. Education, gun rights, mm -hmm. all of this. They're gonna say, if you're, if, if you're on, if you are participating in this Medicare for all or whatever, X, Y, Z, here's going to be all the additional other things. And then you're like, well, I don't want to participate. You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. Or it'll be so prohibitively expensive and like impossible. Mm -hmm. Not to, yeah. Just like insurance. <laughs> so these are the feds starting to crack down. The states acquiescing. Just want to end with one thing here. This is a story that we covered. It was about food sovereignty in Maine. I thought that it was a story that really represented a chance for some crypto savagery. Of course, Maine borders New Hampshire. I thought they have uh, constitutional carry there. They're mo that region is moving in a direction, never mind Bernie and Vermont. <laughs> They're moving in a direction toward more freedom. This was the law that said you can sell raw milk to your neighbors, etc. Not gonna happen. This is... Uh, from the 10th Amendment Center. Oh, actually, I've got the National Blaze one, but I'm going to read a 10th Amendment here. Feds threaten Maine food sovereignty law. Governor LePage caves. Maine Governor Paul LePage has called for a special emergency session of the legislature to roll back a food sovereignty bill he signed into law earlier this year after the federal government threatened to take over meat and poultry inspection in the state. Senator Troy Jackson sponsored Senate Bill 725 titled, quote, an act to recognize local control regarding food systems. The legislation gives local governments the authority to enact ordinances regulating local food distribution without state interference. The new law not only takes a big step forward for food sovereignty and local control by reducing state regulation, it also creates an environment hostile to federal regulations and can potentially nullify some FDA and USDA edicts in effect. Practically speaking, the law eliminates state licensing and regulation requirements on local direct producer to consumer sales and allows local communities to create their own network of distribution and regulation. Under the new law, all food products produced for wholesale or retail distribution outside the municipality will remain subject to all state and federal laws. LD 725 passed both houses of the Maine legislature by wide margins and enjoyed widespread popular support. Food for Maine's future Acting Executive Director Betsy Grohl told the Bangor Daily News she was fighting back tears of joy when she heard LePage had signed LD 725. But the federal government has other ideas. It intends to maintain strict control over Maine food production and distribution, even at the local level. On July 6, the USDA sent a letter to the Maine Department of Agriculture threatening to take over all meat and poultry inspections in the state if the law goes into effect. The feds require state meat and poultry inspection programs to be at least equal to federal inspection programs. The USDA said it is, quote, concerned the Food Sovereignty Act, if implemented as currently written, would contravene federal food safety laws and regu regulations. LePage immediately caved. He responded to the letter by calling a special session to make the new Maine law federally compliant. So for those people who think that the solution is in smaller state government and deregulation, and um, 
decriminalization, which is never, which is always false, and secession. There you have it. No, the answer is in the individual. Mm -hmm. Decentralized, out of government hands, crypto savagery. Boom. Mm -hmm. Crypto savage. And if people want to get these, because they didn't see it, obviously, on YouTube, there should be an R in there's there. GovernYourself.com. But I've got the link in the description. Check that out. Check out the link in the description for my book as well. Thank you to everybody who has purchased that. We'll get that fixed for next week. A little bit of a strange one, but we're coming back off, off censor, YouTube censorship by activist posts. So I think that's it. Let me say goodbye to the people. Thank you for joining us. I really want to thank our guest, Scott Horton, for dropping by and dropping knowledge, crazy knowledge. I'm going to have to go back and check that out. Go and check out his book, Fool's errand.us is the website for that uh, fool's errand time to end the war in afghanistan I want to thank him for being on also uh want to thank christian didn't do that thank you for today if you want to check out our podcast you can do that on itunes and stitcher i'm now going to have to go and update vinarmani.com with all of the past episodes but luckily we mirrored so many of them on bitshoot so bitshoot good looking out thank you guys for being there uh, if you, uh, well, I would say youtube.com slash activist post, but it's not there. We will be back next week, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about and see where this whole censorship thing goes from YouTube and this whole termination and ban. But we will be back, hopefully, streaming on YouTube, streaming on Facebook, and on Twitter and Periscope, 10 a.m., Monday morning, next week. And until then, stay free. <laughs>